This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. It's Wednesday Wonders, science fiction and fantasy on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. The following audio presentation may contain mature language, situations, and violence. Listener discretion is advised. Previously on Edict Zero FIS. There's an explosion at a pawn shop in Gleeds, just outside of Harbor. Someone went through a lot of trouble to contaminate this scene and cover up something here. So, now we're in Edict One conspiracy territory. The currency of power is knowledge. Control knowledge, control everything. That is exactly the kind of language that will burn what's left of your career. It's a map of where to find a spot from there. Behind this building, there was an alley there. No, will you have to see for yourself? I cannot permit you to enter. It's a matter of security and is in the best interest of your safety. And to who am I speaking? I'm the man. Who's telling me how to leave, sir? Where Cook is, but he claims to know what he's doing. He's looking for the next bomb. Or should I say, according to him, he's looking for the same bomb that he's already detonated. The thing was upright, sitting on the air and turning. Around and around like something on a display. Just floating there. Wouldn't some hot buttered popcorn hit the spot right now? Extra fluffy, extra big kernels of it pop to perfection. Then drenched with the golden goodness of pure sweet creamery butter. Mid Candy Read Ball Theaters. Cinema 7. Movie Flex. Sunset Bay, West Island. Saturday, January 3rd, 24-15. Time, 8.55 p.m. The refreshment stand is open. Everything that satisfies your taste buds. Here's the menu. The hottest, freshest, crunchiest popcorn. Eat kernel popped to a support with that real movie time. Here's a drink of popcorn. Thanks. You know what? This is the first time in my 50-some years of coming here that there's been a flesh and blood person standing behind that counter. It's always been Alvin. Gosh, that's one of those precious things in the world that I've come to count on. Hope the old boy will be all right. Alvin will be up and running in no time. Don't you worry about that. There's a nice ride, Alvin. Well, like any other robot, Alvin has to go down for maintenance sometimes. More often lately. Alvin and I both. That's what happens when you're on your way to becoming a fossil, I guess. Takes more to maintain the hardware. Oh, I didn't mean that. Alvin was just fine until a few days ago. Ever since Thursday, New Year's Day, he's been malfunctioning. It's been one thing after another. That's funny for you to mention. My HMS has been on the fritz since about then. Forgetting things. Forgot his own doggone name. <laughs> I thought I was the one who would go senile. <laughs> the Zenus Corporation geeks told me it was a problem with the software. Told me it was fixed. Still wonky. We had people from Xenus here late last night after we lost power and our network went down. A big power surge from somewhere. It blew out all the lights in the basement. Why the basement, I don't know. It must be on an old circuit. There was an explosion in North Island last night, you know? You hear about that? It was out on the West Peninsula near Crown Shore, I think they said. 
Do you suppose there was some connection to that? Oh, no. I, I can't imagine that had anything to do with it. Besides, it was just us. No one else in the town or the strip was affected. That I know of. That is... peculiar. Speaking of peculiar... Excuse me, sir? Sir in the coat with the little girl? Can I help you? Uh, could you please... <sighs> I know he heard me. I think he did too, to tell you the truth. Looked awful shifty too. Wore oh, those sunglasses on after the sun's down. You and that girl look like beggars. Yeah? Is it you who's painting? It is. There's a man who just came in. He's tall, he has long hair, and is wearing a trench coat over a shirt and tie, and sunglasses too. He has a young girl with him. Brunette, dirty dress, you can't miss him. I don't think they have tickets. They came in through the exit door and might be street people. How long ago? Just now. I'll check it out. Let's see here. And we're proud to announce that this theater will soon bring you the greatest array of pictures ever to reach our street. Let's see. You hear the finest stars in exciting performances. You thrill to the suspense. Comedy. Hmm. Romance. And drama. C7 Plex Boot 2. Hey, Miss Bernie. I hope that you've had your eyes on the monitors up there. I'm trying to locate someone who just entered through the exit. He's wearing shaded glasses. He came in with a girl, a child. They may be homeless and looking shabby. They must have entered one of the theaters. Can you point me to the right doors? Okay, stand by. I'll look at the cam feeds. Excuse me. I couldn't help to over here. I think who you're looking for went to that theater there. Tall blind man being led by a girl. A blind man? Yes, I, I presumed he would have to be blind because of the sunglasses. These doors here? Theater 4? Yes, into there. Thank you very much. Brought to you in magic monochrome. For your anachronistic viewing Would you pleasure. mind not shining that light in my face? We're trying to watch a movie here. I'm sorry, I was looking for someone. Boy, I haven't been able to find a man who fits that description you gave me. But I did see a girl who struck me as conspicuous. She looks about eight or nine years old. Did she enter theater for? Yes, that's right. Well, that's where I am now. Wait, she just popped up on one of my monitors here. She must have gone out the emergency door, but the system should have notified me that the door was open. Which emergency door? In Cinema 4? Yes, she's in the fire exit hall at... God. Hello, Goosebumps. She is staring right at me from the screen here. It's as if she knows as if she knows that I'm watching. God, that girl's creepy. How could a little girl be creepy? Why, hello there. What are you doing back here, sweetie? No, there's nothing to be scared about. I won't hurt you. I see your shadow creeping up on my screen. Keep moving forward and I'll have you in view. Where's the man that was with you, honey? Your daddy? Is he your daddy? Did he go down the stairs here? Sir, are you down there? Is anybody down there? Bunny, maybe the shadow I see isn't yours. Where are you? I still can't see you. I can pan the camera, but I can't pitch it. Are you sure you're in the exit hall from Theater 4? Did the man go down the stairs, sweetie? Bunny, what stairs? There are no stairs in the basement from the fire exit hall. Not from any of them. Wait, you're right. You're right. I don't... Wait, are these... What the hell? Are you alright? Move forward so I can see you. <laughs> hey, hey, stay right there, little girl. What's your name? Move forward so... Okay, okay, good. I see the top of your head. I am Bernie. My name is Bernie. What's your name? It's Melissa. What Do not fear the nothing. You've been there before. 
We all end where we begin, without illusions. Yes, yes, Sunset Bay West Island. You've got to hurry. We've had an incident with one of the security guards who's been shot. What the... Oh my God, what the hell? What the hell? I don't know what he was shot by. You hear that, sweetheart? You're in big trouble now. What? Yeah, don't look so mortified. It doesn't match the little dress. Yeah, you're as cute as a bug's ear. If you didn't know better, I'd say you look strikingly innocent. Scratch that. It's entirely too innocent. Yeah, it must be genuine. But spend a little time with Papa Gabo, and we'll work on that. Yeah, you know, you'd be the cat's meow if it didn't have your tongue. You are listening to Edict Zero, FIS, the science fiction audio drama series. Starring James Keller, Julie Hoverson, Phil Rossi, Tanya Milojevic, Russell Gold, Glenn Hallstrom, Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard, Jennifer Dixon, and creator Jack Kincaid. Doc Stager Residence. 1557 Blondview Road, Quentin Falls, East Island, Saturday, January 3rd, 2415, time 7.38 p.m. Margo, you have two email messages which have been auto-sorted into your family drama folder. Oh, thank you, Ursa. I'll have a look at them later. What tangled web of gossip are your cousins weaving now? Oh, you're out of the shower already. You just went up there. Do you feel better? I feel cleaner. Better, no. But better is asking for too much. I don't think that I'll feel better until all this craziness at work and in the world in general is behind us. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Not with this new mess on our hands. What's going on out there, Alan? Why are these mobsters setting off these bombs? Are you any closer to finding the ones responsible for what happened on New Year's? Do you want my answer as an assistant director of the FIS or off the record as your husband? I'm quite sure I asked my husband. Your husband may be having a crisis of confidence about the course that he is obliged to stay. I don't know what end is up. And that's an unfavorable situation for someone in my position, to say the least. Hmm. Ursa. Yes, Alan? Do I still have a call from the office waiting? Yes. Shall I inform the caller that you will be with them shortly? Yes. In just a minute. Alan, I see you're in your robe. Should I call Cal and Sophia and let them know that we won't be over tonight? You don't have to do that. I know how much you enjoy sitting next to the fire and chatting it up with Sophie over wine. I'm sure if you walk next door, they would be delighted to have you. Unfortunately, I just can't tonight. I have a load of work that's going to keep me up into the small hours. The only reason that I'm home is because I missed the sight of you, darling. And I can't stand the sight of the office or Capital City, not after three days. Well, maybe I'll go over for just a little while, so they don't think we're sore at them for any reason. I doubt they would, but nonetheless, you should go. Have a good time. (laughs) <laughs> Tell Cal that I said hi, and Sophie too. Maybe if I have a minute later, I'll use it to slip over for a quick in-person. But right now, though, I'm back off to the command cave. Oh, good luck. People who trust in luck aren't working hard enough. Music off, logging off. I will want to take the call on speaker. There is a video feed to this call. Would you like to reciprocate? No, Ursa. I'm in my jammies. I think we can spare A.D. Kovic of such a vision. Assistant Director David Kovic is not on the line. That conference has been rescheduled for 10.30 p.m. The present caller is Deputy Director Rachel Church. Oh, dear. How long has the Deputy Director been on hold? 14 minutes and 22 seconds. Is this an excessive waiting time, Alan? For a deputy director of the FIS who has called me at home on a Saturday night? Yes, Ursa. By about 14 minutes and 22 seconds. You should know that. I have 
no record of this event occurring in the past. That's because it hasn't. Then switch to Office Ursa mode when we're in my home office, please. Yes, Assistant Director. Thank you. <sighs> the women in my life. Turn the logging back on, please. Let's play ball. Open the line, please. Yes, Assistant Director. Good evening, Deputy Director. I'm very sorry to have kept you waiting. I accept responsibility, but I was ill-informed as to who was on the line. From what I have gathered, you are ill-informed about a number of matters, Assistant Doc Stater. Where would you like me to start? At the beginning would be appropriate. Let's try chronological. The office of the director is troubled by the lack of answers about the New Year's incident. Despite our huge mobilization of resources to your task force, it has failed at its duty. The next press conference for the Attorney General is Monday morning, at which time he's going to be asked some difficult questions. As of right now, we have no answers to give him, and that is a situation that must be corrected. The urgency of the situation does not make it any less complex. It does not change the fantastic intricacies involved in investigating the East Tradon, who from a surveillance standpoint epitomize the challenge of hard targets. Nonetheless, I believe that the report that I submitted to you this morning illustrates real progress, more in two days than we've had in two years. I did not interpret the data as favorably. What I've seen is the disruption of important long-term operations in East Island, compromised intelligence sources, and burned bridges, such as the alienation of the city authorities by DSC Wakeman, and expensive tactical maneuvers which have turned up little. The gain is unimpressive, Assistant Dockstatter, relative to cost. I believe that the gain is unimpressive relative to the desire for an immediate resolution. The desperation to neutralize the threat to the public is only natural under these circumstances. I share that desperation. However, my experience precludes me from also sharing your assessment of our operations, which began less than 72 hours ago. From an objective standpoint that's removed from the pressures and emotional charge of this matter, I don't believe that I could evaluate the developments made in such a short time frame and use that as an equitable barometer for economics or much of anything else, frankly. What I have seen with the string of indictments of East Island mobsters is a public show of justice that just won't last. The hands of justice are being tipped over a sea of lawyers, and I would be remiss to condone that, especially when it has not produced any intelligence about who, specifically, is responsible for the New Year's incident. I understand your perspective. Then you must also understand the perception created by a second bomb being detonated far away from East Island and our highly publicized concentration of assets there. We have made no statements asserting a connection between the two explosions, but as I am sure you're aware, the mainstream media is inferring it strongly. They would not be doing their duty to the people if they weren't inferring it. These are rare events, two days apart, and the similarities of the blasts are difficult to ignore. They have slated some stories for tonight's news broadcasts, which will call into question the direction of our investigations. I'm afraid that I'm going to have to do the same, especially now, after it was brought to my attention that you have authorized a special unit to pursue other angles. It's fortunate that we have this other unit in place to shift public attention to, if need be, but the creation of this fallback hasn't exactly bolstered my confidence that you're secure about your response to the bombing. I believe that sound decisions were made based on what intelligence was available at the time. It occurred smack dab in the scope of an active organized crime operation. That was the most prominent variable from our perspective, but there was a nest of other circumstances which were brought to my attention after. Creating that unit wasn't about fallback, it was about being comprehensive and evaluating the relevance of the leads. And what did the unit determine in regard to those leads? They are still in an investigative phase and have reached no conclusions as of yet, at least none that are so far substantiated from their intelligence gathering and divulged in a report that I could present. That is not good news. It would not be good news if it were otherwise, Deputy Director, as this would mean that our understanding of what we're dealing with is alarmingly limited. If it comes to that, I would implore the Director to keep public relations correspondence focused on the organized crime angle to minimize damage. By that, of course, you mean damage to your reputation. If the Director feels that the FIS must own up to a negligence which did not occur in any fair context and must appoint me as the fall guy for that negligence, so be it. As long as you're both aware that I have no regrets about decisions I've made, and I will defend those decisions accordingly. You may have to. 
Be that as it may, I was not referring to my career. Our show of justice, as you called it, with the East Island mob, provides the public with a sense of security, that we are confronting a known threat. There may be some uncertainty, there always is, but there is no panic, which would result in nothing good for anyone or anything, least of all our efforts to resolve this and eliminate this threat. We have enough challenges on our plate as it is. The way you have just characterized our operation tells me a lot, and it tells me much more than I think you intended. The point is, while there may be some uncertainty, there is a perceived light. Direct attention to the new unit right now, and there is only a darkness. Pending new developments, it would be a mistake. With news trickling out of Gleeds in North Island, your new unit has the attention of the director, Assistant Doc Stetter. The wrong kind of attention. Is that so? How wrong? Clearly wrong enough for me to be contacting you instead of my assistant. There is a situation that concerns an agent under your direct supervision. What has Agent Garrett done? Hogden Avenue, Bleeds, North Island. Time, 7.58 p.m. Message from phone helper. You have a second phone call from SIFHQ, which is flagged as high priority. Press the flash button now to toggle between your current call and your new incoming call from SIFHQ. I understand that, sir, but you are also utilized by Edict 2, and Edict 2 must have a counterpart office which serves your function only at a higher level. We have a sister office below the federal level in Edict 4, but not in 2. Regardless, if there were such an office in E2 with our configuration, they would only share E2 intelligence with E2 agencies. Or in theory, I suppose, E1 agencies. Privilege of information flows up the chain. I did not claim privilege of information. I asked for a direct avenue to request it. This is an urgent matter and time sensitive. All I can tell you is that we received a directive from the E2 military sector about the area of Harbor of North Island that you have inquired about. The directive contained a bulletin with a DOWN provision. Only when needed. Actually, I think it's an acronym for dispatch order when necessary. Whatever. It only instructs to stay clear of the site UAC and authorized by the DOS. That's all I've got. All I can do now is recommend that you follow FIS protocol as it pertains to inquiries about E2 operations and submit a request through your supervisor to be handled by the office of the Attorney General. There is no shortcut to circumvent this process that this office is aware of. That could take months to go through. I don't have months. I may not even have weeks. Oh, Thanks is. for nothing. I knew it's in my back. Agent Garrett. Hello again, Agent Garrett. Agent Mills. You disappeared again. I did not disappear, but I'm about to. Any more time spent here would be a waste. I'm convinced any helpful evidence that we may have found here is already gone. It was gone before we even got off the train. I just got off the phone with the assistant director. Did you know that he's been trying to call you? Did you know that it's impossible for the military to quietly take over a block in a residential district? You're not staying on task. The conspiracist press has caught wind of it, and some of them are in harbor or broadcasting video feeds of the area. What you stumble on here is peculiar, all right. But what led you here in the first place? What was the significance of that location? It's a block from the apartment building where Ethan Bisbee lived. The man who brought the bomb to the pawn shop here? That's right. According to an informant that was in that alley in Harborough where he found it on New Year's Day, it appeared there within seconds of the blast in Center City. It appeared, you say? Agent Garrett is entertaining the theory that the uh, unusual nature of the bomb isn't limited to the damage it causes. He believes... I don't believe that the bomb actually explodes. I believe the bomb or whatever is in the briefcase, creates some kind of disturbance, setting up the conditions for an imminent explosion, which it escapes by relocating itself. Relocating? He's suggesting that it teleports. I wasn't aware that was possible. It's known that we advanced at least to the point where we could teleport the atoms of small objects by exploding quantum entanglement, or, if nothing else, create a duplicate out of corresponding atoms at a new location. The technology that the briefcase suggests is beyond ours. And the only reasonable source for that would be Edict 1. I don't know if it's wise for you to say so. 
to voice an objective opinion? Apparently not. When you do that, people tend to look at you funny. Like the way you're looking at me right now, Agent Mills. I'm just trying to understand where you're coming from. I believe that the briefcase teleported from the Vortex nightclub to that alley in Harborough where Ethan Bisbee found it. Then, last night, when the blast happened here, it teleported again. To where, I don't know. But the man responsible for the Center City bombing is looking for it right now. Mr. Cook is looking for it. Agent Garrett, where are you? Garrett. Special Agent Garrett. Good evening, Assistant Director. I'm glad that you contacted me. You won't be for long. I have the Deputy Director calling me at home to rape me over the coals because of mud being tracked to the Department of Justice. Take a guess what some of that mud traces back to. I apologize. I'll remember to wipe my feet next time. Do not mess with me. I'm your last chance at a meaningful career in the FIS, your last bridge. Burn that bridge and I will see to it that you fall behind a desk so deep in the ground that the next people to lay eyes on your sorry ass will be archaeologists. That would be harsh, sir. In case you need a refresher, the function of Federal Investigative Services is to provide investigative services to the federal government, not to investigate the federal government, which was already frowning on our performance before that mess there in North Island. Sure, it benefits their appearance to be impatient for the delivery of a justice that they're trying to obstruct. Do you have evidence to back up that serious allegation? Not yet. Listen, good. We were already going to receive a notice of procedural review from the Inspector General. That's in reference to the breach of security which enabled the third party to verify themselves as FIS to North Island Police and take unlawful custody of that scene. That was before you submitted a request to that office as well as our own internal affairs department to examine a possible role of the FIS in the contamination of its own goddamn scene. I did? Hmm. Maybe I did. I have done a lot of things today. That was also before you filed electronic complaints with the Federal Department of Security, using language with enough alarming keyword flags to goose the director of the FIS on his pinnacle night. And then, to top it all off, as the perfect final statement on your insanity today, you sent a request for an appointment with the ambassador to Edith Guang. What is it, Agent Garrett? Is this a testament that you've gone off the deep end? Is this a cry for help? Are you high on something that I ought to know about? No. Do you think that would help? I like you better when you don't attempt humor, Garrett. It's easier to tell myself that your disrespect is an unintentional byproduct of being socially retarded. Feel free to quote me on that with HR. I will even set aside time to expound on my statement in person. I don't think that'd be necessary. You need to know when to stop and look around and recognize when you've stepped beyond your experience. I know what you're doing. I know you like a puzzle. I know you like to rattle cages and elicit reactions to read and divine things from. But you're out of your element with this. You cannot treat E3 agencies and branches of government like civilians in a suspect pool for some cozy murder mystery. I'm just trying to do my job and find the truth. I am going to humor you for just a moment. When I say that if there were some hidden truth to be found in that direction, you sure as hell won't find it like that. This is politics. It's a jungle. You can shake the trees hoping puzzle pieces will fall out, but it's much more likely to be a shower of shit and animals that will eat you alive. From this day forward, you will leave those angles to me, Agent Garrett, or you will obtain authorization from my office. Not that this wasn't already protocol. I understand. I hope you do. I expect your report Monday morning, and I will expect you in my office with that report. Physically, in my office. I'll be there, sir. Though I don't see why it's necessary. Because if I have OIG auditor agents up my ass come Monday morning, I'm going to stick my boot up yours, Agent Garrett. Moreover, I think we need to have a very serious in-person chat. Yes, sir. And FYI, I was notified by the DOS of the military operation in Harborough that you have been unduly concerned about. When? Earlier today, before you saw fit to make noise about this to everyone but your supervisor, yours truly. If you had brought this to me, I could have saved us both trouble. They were responding to intelligence through an undisclosed back channel about a bomb at that location. Maybe the same intelligence source which led you there, I do not know. I expect that that will be a new report also. The bottom line is, is that they took this intelligence very seriously, but it turned out to be false. They are withdrawing from the site. They may already be gone. That cover story doesn't jive with what I was told at the scene. And I'll have to go and look for myself if that's all right. If you feel that's worth your time, have at it. Remember, Monday morning, in my office, with your report. One last thing. Agent Garrett! I did not get the sense from Agent Kircher that there is enough teamwork happening. You agents are in a unit. You are one. Act like it. Move like it. And do not do anything else which would be ill-advised. Yes, sir. That will be all. Well? Oh, hello, Agent Kircher. I'm taking off for a while. <sighs> You're what? I'm going for a drive. Meanwhile, you should book us a few hotel rooms. It's getting late. What did Doc Stater say? He said that I should go for a drive, if I felt it was worth my time. 
I do, and I'm going. Don't forget about the hotel rooms. Call me when you have details. Maybe the Major Offender Squad wouldn't have been so bad. How'd you catch her? Mills. Well, the sour look on your face tells me you found Agent Garrett and lost him again. Agent Garrett is lost to himself. Aren't we all? Heart Kill Sanitarium. Inpatient Admissions Center. North Irving, Mainland. Time, 8.27 p.m. May I help you? Hey, excuse me, is this the holding room where... Never mind, it is. Thank you. Fields of monkey poopies! I don't believe you when you say that you don't know. What other places would be attractive to Mr. Cook to detonate? No, 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 no! I'd rather hear of your own attractive places, but I wish to hear it in song. But only in a sultry key. What is your note? You will tell me what I want to know. No, 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 no! You clash your chords and I've heard the song you sing. It's premature and frightens me to speak of solid things. Therefore, good sir, I must insist, I keep you on this string. Do I look like it, sir? Oh, dear. You will tell me what I want to know. Oh dear! So stern. Oh, say things like you mean them meanly. And I shall need much bigger pants. <laughs> what? Agent Resnick, you're wasting your time. Time, time! Who's got the time? See here, my hourglass? No, break the glass and use the sand to rub my cataracts. But clear my eyes and you'll see my windows are quite cracked. For I must find the proper frame of mind to judge your tale. Oh, show me how it swings you through the trees. <laughs> this man is a lunatic. As good it means we brought him to the right place. Uh, we prefer to call them special citizens. You must be Dr. <gasps> Commodore Frayne! Commodore? Oh, I have been promoted from Commander. Well, how unexpected. Dissect the unexpected and inject the foul expected, Commodore. But first, you'll need much sexier clothes. I presume that you two are the agents from the FIS. I'm... He's Special Agent Marcus Briggs, and I am Special Agent Cora Resnick. I'm Dr. Frey. No, 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 no! He's a flat, and she... And she... Oh, dear. I don't know her note. I don't know her oh, note. note. Hmm... Oh, is this... is this... oh, wait a minute, I see. He hits people with a frying pan, which he lets ring out, and whatever musical right. note it is. Oh, well, he calls them by what the note is. This was a new behavior that developed shortly before he left us. I didn't get the chance to analyze the possible significance to that, but now I can. Good luck with that. Perhaps he believes what touches us defines us. <gasps> yeah! What touches us defines us. That may be a keeper. Not bad. Very badly bad, Commodore. But I beg of thee. The captain is disturbed by the presence of these monkeys who will poop on the carpet if you feed them fruit. Beware. Oh, no, Captain. I've eaten all the bananas, I'm afraid. <gasps> oh, my dear Commodore. Pluck the cork from your horn. Embrace for indigestion. I think that the captain would benefit from a reduction of stimuli. No, 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 no. Stimulate the captain. Cast well, him. he'll be fine with our orderlies. If you follow me, please, out in the hall into my office, which would be the best place to talk. Thank you, Dr. Frank. I apologize. We didn't get his prescription information to Mainland General. It hit a bump in the system. Oh, crap. It's Agent Kircher. Is there a place where I oh, can... There's nothing wrong with right there. Answer it. Oh. There was another doctor, or RN, who told me that I shouldn't use my cell in here. Well, I am a Commodore. I probably outrank her. <laughs> well, go ahead. Well, this exam room is empty. You can step in there if you like for some privacy. Thanks. I'll catch up with you guys. Go ahead, Agent Resnick. I'll update you after. Well, as I was saying. Hi, Jules. Agent Briggs, I haven't heard from you. Is everything all right there? Uh, we've gotten all that we're probably going to get out of Captain Socrates. I spent much of today bringing Agent Resnick up to speed. She's a quick study. 
The transfer of Socrates and Jenkins to Harlan Hill hit some snags, but we just assisted with that, and that's where we are now. How is everything on the North Island front? Basically the same. We're no closer to identifying those who impersonated us and compromised the crime scene, despite all of our assets here. There are a number of coincidences, like downtime for the public cameras, and... Honestly, I don't know what to think right now, except that I'm having doubts that Doc Stater's going to stay our assignments to this unit. Agent Garrett seems intent on sabotaging it and has me chasing after him instead of doing anything useful. Then don't chase after him. You have a job to do, and that's not it, so do it. Just do your job. Don't worry about him. I am trying. (sighs) You know what? Maybe the problem is me. We've only been at this for three days. Give yourself a break, Jules. It's not you. That's crazy. What's crazy is, I think you might be right, Marcus. At least he's right that there's something bigger going on here. Bigger than the FIS. Maybe bigger than all of us. I don't know how to contend with this. I don't know what to do with it. If you want my honest opinion, I think you've allowed your personality conflict with Garrett to put you in a funk. Let that be. You're allowing it to distract you and make you stray. I really hope you're not about to tell me how I feel. I didn't like that five years ago, and I don't like it now. You suck at profiling me. Your knee-jerk reaction is feeling that he doesn't respect you. Here we go. If we're profiling anyone, it's Garrett. The point is, is his behavior towards you any different than it is to anyone else? If not, maybe you should not take it so personally. As you said, he has a reputation. I think you're misreading him. What do you think I should be reading? That Garrett is Garrett. He has a good track record, except with people and politics. No one wants to work with him. As far as I know, he doesn't have any friends either. He also has a pretty tragic past, and that might be another reason that he's so messed up. You have to be able to relate with that. You know about what happened to his family? I have from the start. I've been working at HQ, remember? Not much escapes the gossip network there. It doesn't give him a free pass to destroy our careers. Agent Garrett has gone way outside the lines here into left field with conspiracy theories and has ruffled the feathers of people as high up as the deputy director. (laughs) You see the role reversal here? What? A wise person once told me that staying inside the lines isn't what makes us who we are, but the reasons we cross those lines, the reasons we cross them... Do you believe that, or was that just bullshit to maneuver me? That wise person wasn't yet acquainted with Nick Garrett. And I also remember what prompted that not-so-wise person to say what she did. I did. Great, now you have me talking in third person. About doing the right thing? Yes, that sometimes doing the right thing reflects on us in the wrong light. I agree. So you agree that he's doing the right thing? No, I mean... He thinks he's doing the right thing. It's a place to start, and you have more things in common than you think. Focus on that rather than your differences and remember why we're here. Your instincts brought us here. We're here because you noticed a detail that no one else did. An important detail which may be a key to all of this. You saw a girl that no one else gave a damn about. Have you stopped giving a damn? No. Focus on that. You're all set up to meet with O.C. at the London office and talk to a Joe in McCrin's organization. The McCrins had Melissa Parker. We need to know why. I don't like it when you're right. I know. And I assume that Agent Garrett's not there because we've been talking about him so openly. So where is he? He's... I don't know. I don't know where he went. Clean Street, Harbor Road, North Island, time, 8.40 p.m. Sir, can you tell me why there was a construction crew here? Little repaving of the street, sir. All done. Don't walk past the cones. Hasn't dried completely. You repaved the street? 
Were you called in by the military? Oh no, we were called in by the city. Northwest Industrial Services. Interesting. Okay, so they repaved an area of the street. They came here to repave? Why repave? Goodness. Uh, you look lost, son. Uh, hello there. I'm sorry you startled me. Uh, why ever should you apologize, sir? I cannot fathom a more appropriate response to a disembodied voice in a dark alley. Yes, it is dark. The streetlights are out and I didn't catch you with my flashlight. I didn't see you there. There are a lot of things which you cannot see, sir. But I suspect that it's a limitation which you should feel thanks for, rather than regret. Unless, of course, your regret is based on a faulty premise. What? Uh, I'm sorry, but who are you- Again with the apologies. If you believe that you displayed a sign of weakness, which could be exploited, an apology might only be suitable if self-directed, but no more useful to you than it would have been to me. I assure you that if I were a predator who caught a flash of the vulnerability behind the strong facade that your primal directives prescribe, your apology would not enter my mind before or after I cobbled you up. Sir, are you threatening me? Do you feel threatened, sir? I was questioning your intent. If you feel you must, then if there's any apology in order, it is from me, sir. I am told by those who make my acquaintance that I have a rather odd way about me, which can cause discomfort or awkwardness. Yes, I believe that I could be viewed as a bit clumsy to the sensibilities of people, sir. The natural gravitation of human conversation often eludes me. I can accept this shortcoming, but I would understand if you cannot sympathize with my social challenges. Actually, I can. I also thought I recognized your voice from somewhere. Here, as a matter of fact, earlier today. But I saw the face that went with the voice. You don't have it. I should hope that this is my blessing, sir. You seem to be a pleasant old man. That assessment is welcome, sir, and suitable in that I have done nothing to contradict it. Actions reflect reality, not words or subjective interpretations of them. Without evidence of conflicting action, there is no extracting what is from what seems to be. Wouldn't you say, sir? Hmm. There is no means of distinguishing what is as a separate entity from what seems to be relative to the observer not relative to what is. How delightful. So our what is is a sentient entity. I thought you were talking about you. What are we talking about? Philosophy, apparently. Under the shine of Thales. No. Tonight is overcast. Hmm. Look at that. It poked out of the clouds. My uncanny sense of timing has been known to redeem me. Understand, sir, that my only aim was to point out that you looked rather lost. Oh, I thought so, so I said so, sir. We're back to the difference between seeming and being. I'm not lost. I know where I am. Well, then perhaps, if I may be so bold as to speculate, sir, something else is lost to you. And you've come to look for it. Here. I'm here because I am... I'm curious. Just like the others who were here. I'm curious about what took place here. Why the military was here. What they may be hiding. Well, I hope that you're not inferring that you're one of those conspiracists. Hmm. Why are you out here, if you don't mind me asking? I have my own curiosities, sir. Even knowing how very dangerous of a business curiosity can be, how it can inspire us to suspend better judgment in seeking the objects of its desires. Wonder 
can lead to much trouble, I find. It can lead to trouble, yes, but it also can lead to discovery. Should the discovery be the trouble, it may be better to wonder than to discover, sir. Might then wonder be a precious thing to be kept. Kept and not exchanged for something much less or far worse. Mystery can be kind, sir. Why are you saying these things to me? I say the things which come to mind, sir, as you do. Sometimes discovery leads to more wonder. And the only thing better than a good mystery is solving it. Mystery is the key to romance, which is a fabulous but tragically suicidal thing. Romance elicits a passion for the disclosures, which will hasten its end. Let's solve a mystery right now, with introductions. You illustrate my point, sir. My name is Nick Garrett, Special Agent Nick Garrett with the Federal Investigative Services. You don't have an implant. I'm going to need to see your CID. Fortunately for our romance, I cannot accommodate your needs. I have never been issued a CID number. Certainly not a document displaying it. Who are you? I am the man in the alley, sir. Much the same as you. Two of a kind, aren't we? Two men in an alley with curiosities. You already know who I am. Indeed I do, sir. I know it better than you. But I will refrain from another digression into the difference between seeming and being. Your name... I will take you into custody. Will you, sir? I suspect that your ability to see into the future is as stifled as your ability to see into the past. Regardless, sir, you have no grounds on which to do that. I have not committed any crime that I'm aware of. I am just a man on a public street making conversation. All by it, cryptic conversation. Compounding the mysteries, and with them the romance. That you refuse to give me a name is enough grounds to detain you. Then I shall give you a name, sir. Rupert T. Cantera. Is that your name? I wonder. I wonder how far a man with an affliction to tell the truth will go to maintain loyalty to his nature. How much would he let die so that his principles may live? Does he estimate the worth of his personal integrity so highly that he would allow the destruction of everything else to keep it? Would he rob the world of romance? What are you talking about? Relativity. A romance. Frames of reference. For example, sir, Relative to you, I am about to walk through a wall, sir. Now watch. Don't move around. Garrett. Where are you? I'm in Harborough and I just... Never mind. I'm heading back to Gleed's now. Do we have lodging for the night? Agent Mills gave us access to a vacant safe house in Shelton, west of Gleed's. I've emailed you the details. Did you find anything in Harborough? Relatively speaking, I found romance. If you found romance, then I'm in the wrong place. Have you heard from Agent Briggs? Is he on his way with Agent Resnick? Not yet. Right now they're at Harlan Hill Sanitarium talking to a psychiatrist. Well then, that makes two of us in the wrong place. Office of Dr. William Frayne. Harlan Hill Sanitarium. North Irving, 
Mainland. Time, 8.55 p.m. This fish tank filter is one day overdue for a cleaning. To maximize the health of your aquatic life, please service soon. Well, we've been busier than usual since New Year's. Dramatic events played out through the media can serve as a trigger or catalyst to psychological conditions. Of course, we have seen a gradual increase of mental illnesses over the past few decades. This is about as inexplicable as the reduced effectiveness of the medications to treat them. It's a growing problem. I hope that you do not mind that we have asked you to stay and answer some questions, Doctor. We must leave first thing in the morning. Oh, no, I don't mind. Besides, I was already here. When I heard that our esteemed captain would be returning to us tonight after all, I thought it would be best that I return. Anything to help mitigate the trauma and undoubtedly the drama of his being reintroduced to the system. Five months is quite a long time to be free roaming without the structure that he needs. I'm concerned about how far back this may have set him. He and 3393. Donald Jenkins. Well, I'm not as concerned about Mr. Jenkins. He always responded reasonably well to treatment, to those disorders that we chose to treat. There are an entire host of them which come into play in that man and complicate things. Perhaps the best medicine that we found for him was time with Captain Socrates, whose presence reduced his psychotic components. Uh, there was a mutual dynamic there, actually, given that Mr. Jenkins is the only patient that the captain ever got along with that I'm aware of. Of course, they were brought in together. From New Baltimore. You are his doctor, and you call him Captain Socrates. Is this something you should encourage? Well, the only other thing to call him would be 1422, I suppose. His patient ID number. We were never able to discern his real identity or draw it out of him. Well, I believe that something caused his sense of identity to fragment, and his mind buried much of it as a defense mechanism. I had a thought. I'm not a psychiatrist, and I don't know a great deal about theater, which he definitely has a past in. Oh yes, I have no doubt of that. But I have worked for years in organized crime, and I have known undercover agents who took on a persona that they had trouble snapping out of after the operation ended. Well, that's fascinating. Okay, I'm listening. Well, could this be like that? A character persona that he adopted for whatever reason and couldn't find his way back from? Well, it's more likely one that he doesn't want to snap out of. I like that you brought up theater. Who was it who said that the best actors are cases of controlled D.I.D.? There are mild forms of DID, and we do see some of the most interesting cases in actors who employ certain methods. I'm not suggesting a causal relationship exactly, only that the processes of the disorder can be exploited. Much like the hypomanic phase of manic depression can be exploited to produce well beyond what normal human functioning would allow. DID? Well, dissociative Identity Disorder. The disassociation is almost always a coping device created by a mind which has sustained traumatic damage. If the present identity, the personality, in the frame of perception which comes with it, cannot emotionally cope with its environment, another one is created that can. I'm generalizing, which is hard to do with something so complicated, but there is indeed a DID component to his dysfunctions, as well as a very rapid cycling. Uh, rapid cyclers are, if nothing else, emotionally experienced. They can go through more emotional turmoil in one day than the rest of us do in months. I've heard some describe days that felt like months, and downshifts which stretch minutes into hours. Time slows down with greater gravity. Oh, does it really? I would have expected Agent Garrett to say something like that. Who? Don't worry about it. I wish to know about the implants that you install in patients. Well, they're just your standard combo of ID and medical, which many people with conditions elect to have put in so medics can simply sweep their scanner and access their entire medical history. Conditions, prescriptions, allergies, and yes, psychiatric disorders on the spot. It has saved many lives. How difficult are they to remove? The implants that should have been in these patients were missing. How could that be? Well, I saw the scans from Mainland General and they were peculiar. 
You need the right equipment to extract them, and though you can heal the skin over after, there should be subcutaneous signs of implants having been there. There were none. Oh, I never saw that before. I don't have an explanation for you, I'm afraid. It's odd. Did any of the five patients who escaped have any expertise that you know of that could have helped remove the implants? Well, not that we were aware of. Given the mysterious nature of these patients, I suppose it's possible on a guess. Unlikely, but possible. Was there any relationship between Captain Socrates and Mr. Cook? The records that Harlan Hill provided us with weren't as informative as we had hoped. Mr. Who? Patient 2871. Well, I see. I'm sorry. He threw me for a moment with the Mr. As he came to us with no name, we appointed him the name of David, but he stopped responding to it when other patients addressed him as Cook. Why Cook? Well, we have a reward system available to eligible patients. They earn points for taking their medicine on time, good behavior, cooperating with the staff, and participation in therapy groups. They can exchange their points for time in rec rooms, field trips on the grounds, and attending school, which is just what it sounds like. We offer a program of classes. Cook only ever expressed interest in the home ec cooking class. Because he had been with us so long and had been what we call a model citizen, he was also given the rare opportunity for work in the cafeteria kitchen. Unsupervised? Oh no, supervised. I, well, I know what you're thinking. Because of access to utensils, such as knives, that is not a duty which we would reward to any patient who had a history of violence or manifested any signs of psychosis. He had been with us for years. He was as agreeable as patients come, due in part, we believed, to learning challenges in the autism spectrum. In addition to, uh, well, this was my suspicion, mind you, well, well, retrograde amnesia, possibly dissociative in nature. It's difficult to diagnose patients with little to no communication skills. He didn't speak? Not a syllable. Oh, what's more, he never seemed to try. He did try to write, but this led mainly to frustration. He's gotten over being mute since then. Oh, really? Fascinating. So the kitchen is where he had access to the knife, which he used to cut out his eyes. Oh, we were never able to ascertain what brought that on. Could it have had anything to do with Logan Wendell? Uh, 2847... His M.O. was removing his victim's eyes. Did they have any contact? No, of course not. 2847 was in the maximum security ward. Permanent solitary. I hope that you catch him again. I heard that he murdered another of the patients. Adrian Frick, 1712. Yes, Adrian. Well, well, Logan Wendell will kill again, you know, if he hasn't already. The FIS has agents working with the Ferguson City Police to catch him. Our main concern right now is Cook. How did they escape? I have seen the security measures that you have in place. They're not simple to bypass. Well, we don't know. These patients were simply there one minute and gone the next. We're hoping that the captain might shed some light on how they did it, which Adrian may have played a key role in, may have. You see, Adrian wasn't always a patient. Well, he worked with our security department, and he was once a guard in the ward where Logan Wendell was contained. He asked for a transfer out of that department, and the paperwork was pending. He clearly had an underlying condition that our screening process didn't catch a susceptibility, and his exposure to the patients there resulted in a psychotic break. You believe Adrian Frick may have been the mastermind of the escape? Well, I find that hard to believe, as he had become incapable of organized thought, but his knowledge of the facility is suggestive, isn't it? Would Adrian Frick have known how to remove the implants? Well, if he did, it wasn't from his employment experience here. That procedure is outsourced, and as I told you, he was only a guard. Wait, did he go to the cafeteria? What? The cafeteria where Cook worked. Was that only for patients, or did staff use that cafeteria too? Could Adrian have met Cook there? No, we didn't think of that. It sounds plausible. Well, it could explain how Cook linked with him. 
There's one thing you haven't explained about Cook that isn't in the records we have. How did you acquire him? I presume that he didn't just drop out of the sky onto your doorstep. He was sent to us nine years ago by order of a South Island court who rolled the transport to an ambulance service out of Sterling. Police had taken him into custody after they responded to calls from citizens who reported a suspicious character lingering in their neighborhood with disturbing interest in the neighborhood children. He was looking for random children? Well, the report given to us stated that he was disoriented, confused, and didn't seem to know who he was or why he was there. The police tried to match his description with any missing persons from Hendersville and the surrounding area, but were unsuccessful. Hendersville? Hendersville, South Island? Yes, that's where he was picked up. I don't think that he was looking for random children. I think he was looking for a specific one. He did one. Clandestine complex. Chamber 18. London, North Island. Time, 9.15 p.m. Good evening, Agent Zell. How delightful to see an unfamiliar face. Not unfamiliar to you, of course. Though I suspect that it has been quite some time, has it not? It has. I judge from the neutrality of your tone that you don't find this development entirely favorable. Do tell, Agent. When you looked in the mirror, did you see yourself? Or your ghost? It's favorable, Ambassador. It will take getting used to again. Relative to what you've become accustomed to, I imagine so. Ah, it's a night for talks of romance and relativity, it seems. Ambassador, are you... uh, Yes. Are you sure that this is a good idea? Oh, Agent, asking me if I'm sure. As if I would have let such a radical course of action if I weren't. If it will offer you solace, Agent. I've been extremely thorough in examining this choice. As it happens, you are simply more useful to us right now as yourself, as you were in the beginning. Why, you must feel eerily as if you've come full circle. I may encounter people from my past. How wonderful for you. It sounds like it has the potential for a number of splendid little sit-downs. Perhaps with a spot of tea. I'm concerned about whether the cover story will hold. Oh, you're covered, Agent. Now shall we proceed? Do you wish to offend me further with more inquiries? (laughs) Let's proceed. Oh, worry not. Now, we have confirmed the presence of 45Q98 in West Island, and find a 94% probability that his acquisition of the artifact item has already occurred. 262-144. The exploding briefcase. However, we have the borders secure. He has cornered himself that he cannot leave the island. By now, he understands that in his efforts to disrupt our physics, he has done the same to his own. He will lose cohesion. He can no longer utilize Artifact 838-8608. His teleportation device. And like 262-144, one which introduces these troublesome physics, not ours. Be advised that with him is 26A-64, the girl. I understand. You have your orders. Step forward onto the platform, Agent. You... How shall I say? Know the drill? Yes. You will arrive in a hidden room at the Central Railway Station in Newmark City. Be advised that through the one-way door and across the hall, you shall find here a laboratory. Thank you, Ambassador. And to you, FIS Special Agent Benjamin Zern, 
I bid you. Good day. WW Railways. Nigel Morris Gateway Station. New Marks City, West Island. Down, buddy. Yeah, party, party. That's my life. One big party. One big party. <laughs> Look at you. What? Looking all bug-eyed at yourself. You look like you've been goosed by the devil, dude. I feel like it. F I S safe house. 351 Dempster Road, Shelton Village, North Island. Time, 10.20 p.m. I'm a man who knows his awful purpose. Now give me the pan, it's mine! First cook, Mr. Mm. Cook. Deliver the pan, and I shall tell you the tale of the eyes which saw abominations to the mind behind them. I'll tell you the tale of the man who caught the world at its lies, its fabric mm. and its flimsiest, and saw the cruel truths of its own nature. Far, How many times are you going to listen to those? I don't know. Twice more. Three times more. A hundred times more, I can only speculate. Did you think that, ooh, maybe you wouldn't have to listen to it so many times if you didn't have the television turned up and your music player going? It helps me focus. I think I'm gonna take a break and watch a little Gabba, though. That helps me focus, too. Hmm. Actually, I think I have the New Year's Eve show that I missed. Did you know Gabbo made an appearance? You, uh, didn't tell me what you were doing in Harbro earlier. I didn't know that I was supposed to tell you. You went back to that site, didn't you? How did that work out for you? <laughs> you mean, gaining access? That was easy. The military was gone. Everyone was, except for the last of the conspiracists who were there earlier. Oh, and then there was that construction crew, but they were also leaving. What were they doing there? Oh, Northwest Industrial Services. I imagine the same thing that they did at the scene of the explosion at the pawn shop. They were destroying evidence, covering up something. What do you mean? What work did they do? They repaved the section of the alley where my informant said the briefcase appeared. Why would they do that, Agent Kircher? Why would they replace a section of pavement? I don't know. I don't know either. I don't even suspect. What I do suspect is that briefcase bomb reappeared somewhere else, just like it did in the alley. Mr. Cook is looking for it, and if what Captain Socrates told Briggs is true... He will waste no time in detonating it. He will do it without care of who it kills. He may not even believe there's anyone real to kill. What? To his heart, the meaning of all life and the meaning of his are the same. They are zero. He'll destroy us all. He's out there. He might already have it. We have no line on him. Uh, where's my phone? They are zero. Seeming and being. Beautiful lies. Hello, Agent Briggs. What is Romance. Go on. And disclosure. He was. Briggs has something? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Of course. Good night. Listen to this. In 2406, Cook was picked up by officers because he was wandering a neighborhood, incoherent, and apparently staring at children in a way that disturbed their parents. And this was in Hennersville, South Island. Hmm? That's where Melissa Parker lived. 
She also lived in that very neighborhood. Three years before her parents were murdered and she went missing. If Cook was in the sanitarium, he has an alibi for that, but this means that he was looking for her even back then. He has been looking for her a very long time. The question is why? What did she mean to him? Maybe she had the same value as she did to those who took her and kept her. But he killed her at the Vortex nightclub, along with Jacob Tonell, his cronies, and more than 80 others. God, what if she's the reason that he detonated the bomb? Maybe that's why he brought the bomb there, to kill her. Could that have been the point? Interesting. But how would he know that she would be there, unless... Unless Jacob Tonell meant to trade her. Cook didn't ask for money as payment for the Hexgate disc. He asked for her, and he must have known that Tonell had access to her. Again, we come back to what makes her so important. Important enough to murder her parents and kidnap her? Important enough for the McCrins to keep her? And apparently more important to Mr. Cook than the lives of others that were lost in the blast. If you're on the right track, I don't believe Cook weighed any pros and cons before doing what he did. The meaning of all life and the meaning of his are the same. They are zero. He'll destroy us Those people didn't die out of any directed want on Cook's part to kill them. They died because Cook just didn't care. Life has no value to him, but clearly Melissa's life did. Or he wouldn't have gone through such trouble to take it. We need to solve the Melissa riddle. That is the key to this. Then tomorrow, when you're talking to that informant, find out why she died. By finding out why the McCrins had let her live. Marshfield Road, South Irving, Mainland. That's the first time I've seen the infamous Harlan Hill. The place would be creepy enough without being in the middle of nowhere. I can't believe the closest motel I found was in Promontory. Hey, at least we'll be right there by the station to catch a train tomorrow. <sighs> Look at it out there. There's a whole lot of nothing. Do you always talk to yourself? I thought I was talking to you. Guess not. I've always found the country to be spooky. No lights, weird sounds, strange smells. You grew up in the city? I did. Detroit City, East Island. Then that's why. People who grew up in the country have similar discomforts about urban areas. Where'd you grow up? That does not matter. What matters is that I like the country best. You don't like all the lights, huh? I love the lights. In the sky. Oh, a stargazer. The distance that the light travels from the stars to reach us is amazing. The eternities that it takes to do so is also amazing. It is. Some of the stars we see are already gone. Everything changes. But nothing is ever gone. It would be nice to believe so. We are being followed. Are we? You have taken too many turns as well as a back way, and there is a dark car following us trying to stay out of sight. It could be one of ours executing a follow. Why? I don't know. What kind of car? Crown Victoria, on a guess. Year 11 to 13. That's a pretty specific guess. It could be an unmarked car. Do you think this is going to be a problem? Can't say for sure. I guess we'll find out as the ride progresses. If it is a problem, that is alright with me. I like finding solutions to problems. I admire your spirit. McCandy Regal Theaters. Cinema 7. Movie Plex. Sunset Bay, West Island. This is the crime scene. Look at the yellow tape. It's talking to you. You see here? It says crime scene. Do not pass. Do you see? Do you see this badge? 
with the letters F I S. Oh hell, I'm sorry. We've been having problems tonight with the comprehension of people. Yeah, it's one of those nights. Yo, detective, we got a fat hair. We got a fat. I'm a detective Saxon, SBPD. Good evening, Detective Saxon. I understand that there was a murder here with some unusual circumstances involving a man wearing a long coat and sunglasses. He also had with him a young girl. Would that be accurate? That depends on who's asking. If you're a fed, you got Chris? I am Special Agent Benjamin Zern from Federal Investigative Services. So you are. Welcome to my Saturday night. If you would follow me, please, I will show you the scene which we have secured and bring you up to speed with what we know. Thank you for listening to this episode of Edict Zero FIS. Music and ambience heard on the show come from Nine Inch Nails, ERH, Kevin McLeod, How to Destroy Angels, and Natalie Nicole Gilbert. Other music and sound effects come from public domain show producer and Slipgate 9 studio resources, as well as material released freely on the internet through such venues as the Internet Archive. Look to the show credits on the website for more information. This show was produced by series creator Jack and Kate, James Keller, and Jane Eastman. Associate producers C. Edward Reed, Julie Hoverson, and Thomas Glan. This episode is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 3.0 United States License. For more information on Edict Zero FIS, visit its home at edictzero.wordpress.com or the Slipgate 9 Entertainment Production Blog at slipgate9.wordpress.com. Thank you for listening. For those listeners who have been here with us for the first episodes as they happened, we thank you for accompanying us on this journey. Episode 5, Relativity, was the last episode of Edict Zero FIS for the year 2010, but we hope you'll join us again in 2011 for the second half of Season 1, starting with Episode 6, Jamais Vu, in January. We also invite you to visit our website at edictzero.wordpress.com and check out other pages on the site, such as the series extras page, where you can find music used in producing the shows, as well as other bonus tracks. If you would like to help spread the word about the show to help ensure that it will continue into the future, tell your friends, review us on your blog, or consider leaving a review for the show on the Internet Archive or on iTunes. Slipgate 9 Entertainment is a not-for-profit production endeavor which prizes audience over all else. And episodes of Edict Zero FIS will always be free, but only through the support of listeners like you will it grow and continue well into the future, in addition to other productions. Thank you for your support. Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is on the air! Exclusively on Mutual, the Summerstock Playhouse is an annual celebration of old-time radio remakes by modern-day audio drama producers, each putting their own special spin on a classic program. Don't miss a single episode, Sundays in July and August, only on Mutual. Better living through audio. Do not adjust your sets. You're tuned to Wednesday Wonders on the Mutual Audio Network. Tomorrow on Mutual is Thursday Thrillers, our roundup of action, adventure, mystery, crime drama, and thrillers, of course. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of diverse audio tales. Or find the Thursday Thrillers feed in your favorite podcast players. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.